Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are on this fast forward planet. A very turbulent place these days, politically, climatologically, uh, in terms of the information environment, perhaps more so than anything else. Uh, we're surrounded by um, information overload and uh, information deceit and information monetization, and it all gets in the way of the other things, having a stable relationship with climate and uh, avoiding conflict. We're in the entering the well into the third year of uh, Putin's invasion of Ukraine, et cetera. This is Andy Revkin, Sustain What Enterprise. And today I'm going to try to find out about a uh, an online course that's designed to um, give people a smoother path in times of turbulence and even breakdown. Um, and I've uh, got uh, Josh Fox, the filmmaker who I've known for a long time, coming on shortly. And Daniel uh, Pinch, um, Pinchbeck is in Miami in the train station. Uh, he's going to come on now to uh, tell us a little bit about how they got together, what this course, um, Embracing Our Emergency, uh, it's going to run from late April through late May online. It's a live, sort of a live set of seminars and what it's about and what we hope, what they hope to accomplish. So it's great to have you here. Uh, can... Thank you, Andrew. So I thought we'd start a little bit with... Uh, with you for whom, you know, not everyone out there would know your background. Uh, um, t tell us a little bit about how you came to be who you are so far and and what got you into dealing with this kind of super wicked yeah. challenge. Exactly, well, I mean, um, I mean, I was also a, a journalist and a magazine editor um, in my 20s. Uh, and I went through a kind of existential crisis in my late 20s. Uh, and that was back in the 90s, late 90s. And I remembered my psychedelic experiences from college and ended up writing a book called Breaking Open the Head. That was one of the first books to sort of be taken seriously about psychedelics um, since the early 70s. Um, so you were, you were ahead of the curve there because suddenly that's become kind of a mainstreaming arena. Yes, exactly. And in, in that book, I was already writing about the ecological emergency. I mean, I went to parts of the Amazon where their oil companies had really uh, defar you know, destroyed, despoiled uh, the lands and so on. And uh, I already was, you know, I, sort of, I was sort of hoping that, you know, a new, a new, particularly with ayahuasca, which is this rainforest medicine, uh, we would see a huge ecological kind of upsurge. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, it's happened to some degree, but maybe not as I'd hoped. And then I wrote a second book. Uh, I mean, it's a long story, my, my story, but I mean, um, I got, I got, you know, I had a lot of experiences that, Kind of shifted me from a reductive materialist or physicalist worldview to more of a you know Jungian kind of like uh, paranormal psychic um, worldview. And my second book was looking at the prophecies uh, of indigenous cultures um, like the Maya, the Hopi, and so on. And then my third book was actually looking at the ecological emergency, trying to take lessons from Buckminster Fuller and the Gaia hypothesis, and uh, think about that was 2016, so it got kind of eclipsed by the whole. A Trump moment. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, I, I you know, I, I assume, you know, like you, it's just this feeling that we're, we're, you know, we're, we're missing the boat here, you know, that um, we, uh, we had a, we had a, you know, we had a relatively short time and whether it's due to, you know, people just uh, being overwhelmed or the corporate disinformation campaigns or the political uh, logjam, you know, it just feels like, uh, you know, people have not rallied in the way that they, they needed to. And, um, you know, now we're just in a different situation. A few years, you know, it's, 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 you know years have passed. And, um, you know, I, I, my sense is that people are not really thinking about what this is now going to mean for their future. Um, you know, we have some people on the course who, uh, like Nate Hagens, I don't know if you know him. The great I do. Uh, yeah, he was, on, he was on this show in the first year, the first months, the first weeks of the pandemic. And he was in his yard with chickens around him, uh, yeah. talking about uh, the uh, the uh, post fossil journey and how hard it is and what to do. But it was yeah, he was one of the first guests. That's cool. You know, Jeb Bendel. No. Oh well, I know of her. Yeah, but not him. I uh, have. He wrote a book called uh, Well, his new book out called Breaking Together, uh, which I would recommend. He might be a very interesting guest for you. I'd be very curious actually to see what okay. you think of his ideas. Um, and then also, I mean, these are people I've brought on. Josh has brought on an, an amazing assortment of people uh, for the course, uh, including Marion Williamson and Bill McKibben and, and Jane Fonda. 
Uh, but I've right. also brought on uh, Gail Bradbrook, you probably know about, who was one of the founders of Extinction Rebellion uh, right. and is now doing a lot of work with the Global South. Uh, so what we want to do is really provide like a model for people to think about what's happening because, you know, I'm sure you also agree, the media is sort of cloaks it or obscures it, really is not, you know, and if you look at, unfortunately, a lot of the, the current climate information is quite dire. Uh, and there's really no sense, it's not really reflected in the mainstream, how much this is going to impact people's lives even in the next few years. So we want to, we want to you know, presence that for people. I think it's much easier to do that if you have a community of people who, uh, you know, care for each other and support each other and are going through a learning journey together. And then we want to think about help people sort of plan what they can do on, on the sort of different levels. You know, what is like right. individual, family, you know, another is like local, regional, community. Then the third level is what you contribute to a more like, you know, planetary, uh, uh, unified uh, scenario. So right. you know, that's... Well, and, and the, the, the initial part is the self, too. A, a big chunk of the pitch is about people who feel, uh, the, I, I think, I, let's maybe get some clarity on who you hope this is for. And I do get the sense it's for people who feel paralyzed or who personally are grappling uh, emotionally with um, the, the state of the land. And Josh, hey, hey, so Josh Fox is here now, too. Thank goodness. Sorry, I was late. You. It's been a long time. Uh, I'm so happy to see you, Andy. It's, uh, it's, been, it's been too long. Um, and thank you, Daniel, uh, for, for all this. Um, you know, so I think uh, just in terms of uh, evoking our mutual history, Andrew, um, you know, six years, seven years ago, eight years ago, when I put out How to Let Go of the World, we were sort of predicting a moment of real hardship in the climate and of things being very, very dire. And yeah. uh, we're now in that moment. And um, so things have shifted. And, and I think before you that, go on, I want to just linger on that film okay. because it had that sense of embracing that you're now talking about in this series too, like getting uh, comfortable is not really the right word, but tell me, you know, well, is this sort of evolved in you? Uh, Daniel uh, approached me with this idea and he had the title of the class embracing our emergency. And I just immediately understood that and immediately identify with that and told him about this film, which he had not seen how to let go of the world and love all the things climate can't change. It's a much longer title than embracing our emergency. Um, <laughs> but, but, but I felt that there was a, a immediate resonance and immediate um, un, kinship and un, un understanding of this idea because, you know, that movie, How to Let Go of the World, was a movie about climate anxiety, a movie about climate despair, way, way ahead of its time, right? Like, that we were getting that before the, reg, the, the rest of the world, before the Gen Z, before the Greta Thunberg, before the, you know, Jamie Margulins of this world, who then grew up with that sense of impending apocalypse and doom, you know, and were facing very harsh realities. Um, and... I think there's a wonderful uh, kinship between Gen Z and Gen X, which I belong to, which is that the Gen X is sort of the punk rock apocalyptic nuclear war generation. And the Gen Z is sort of like the climate change apocalyptic nuclear war uh, generation. So there is this weird lack of expectation and lack of of of, of what I would say, um, I don't know, of, 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 of thinking that some good thing is going to happen to us that brings this weird yeah. thing together that we hit things head on. But embracing our emergency to me is this idea of, you know, you do have to go through the looking glass to come out the other side. And there are people who who are already on that other side and that we can learn from that experience. Because I do think that activism in general is like being a, 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 an attention deficit disorder marathon runner. You know, you constantly think the race is going to be over right. like the next 20 seconds, um, and yet it's going to go on for your whole life. So you have to constantly right. be re-energizing re and re-engaging. Re Robert Persig, my, one of my favorite writers in the Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, talks about this word gumption, which is a fantastic word, gumption, mm -hmm. and how gumption is so necessary <laughs> in, in activism in general, but in climate activism in particular. So I feel like embracing our emergency sort of also could be called recharging our gumption or something, that this, um, this idea that we, we are in a different moment. The skies have turned orange in New York City. Yeah. Forest fires are rampant, and forests, by the way, are not just 
empty nothing places forests are my favorite places on the planet and right. the fact that they're burning and all the things in them are dying is a, an absolute insane horror um right. you know just because no people live in them doesn't make it okay you know um so there are all of these things that are and the ocean temperatures and, and and all the forecasts that are really coming to life right now that even michael mann admitted yesterday on 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 twitter we don't actually know why this is happening so fast um i have my own yeah. theories and i have some people in the science world who've been affirming those theories but you know we are in a very different moment than we were even five years ago and so embracing our emergency has somewhat to do to me with oh my god people are sort of in a little bit of shock and right. how do we address that shock and and how do we just start talking about it like i have faith in dialogue i have faith in conversation and i think more than anything i have faith in asking the right questions not necessarily having all the right answers i like it when things are half baked you know what i mean like because yeah. you can only bake them so far until the group collective experience and the con the conversation the dialogue of a class or of a film or of a tour starts to then get us to the next place so in this way it's sort of like you know like einstein says you have your one foot on what you know you know on firm ground and the other you know reaching for the stars um and i think that's what that's what the spirit of this 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 undertaking yeah. is yeah and D daniel i want to bring you in again too on this idea of um the mental model I do yeah. think a lot of people saw that. I was just talking to a, a young journalism student this morning about um, <clears throat> when I started writing about global global warming in the 1980s. It felt like a pollution problem, you know. You yeah. stick smokestack. It's it's like what we did with the Clean Air Act, and that had that has sort of like an end point. We've done there's still a lot of clean air to clean up around the world, but the United States did a huge lift on that. And then I realized, oh no, this is bigger than that. It's about energy needs and you know and, and long term changes in society, not just the climate. And then you know I was thought so it's a diplomatic it's a diplomacy problem. You know we need a treaty. And then it's like it's a political problem. It's a power problem. And you realize it's all of those problems. And it reminds me of uh, uh, Timothy Morton's hyper object, you know, revelation when you realize the shape of the thing you think you're looking at is fundamentally different. And that's what leads to the need for what what Josh was just describing, which is sort of urgency and patience in, in some weird way. Is that is you know, when people come through the 10 days of the training, the 10 sessions, what's how much of it is about offering them a possibility of a new vision of the problem and how much of it's about sort of concrete examples of stuff to do? Yeah, I think I think it'll be a balance of the two. I mean, um, you know, I'm actually finding myself as I prepare for the course, going back and and reading a lot more about the current situation yet again, and and you know it's tough. I mean, it, it's actually it's hardcore with what, what's happening. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I, I yesterday I spoke to uh, I don't know if you know Neil Teese wrote a book on notes on complexity. He, he writes about complexity theory and mm -hmm. kind of a holarchic view of uh, the cosmos and a kind of. Um, he ended up having the same perspective that I have that actually it's much more likely that consciousness is kind of the underlying or like the, the foundational primitive, uh, the primary aspect of reality. And that's why we can't solve the hard problem of consciousness. Uh, but I think that there is a way that um, we can understand everything that's happening in ways that help us to integrate it. You know, like, like the Gaia theory, like thinking about um, you know, kind of the evolution of Earth, of Earth and of species in terms of complexity theory and so on, um, and and sort of put ourselves more on, on, a, on a macro scale. You know, even as we deal with the uh, the immediacy. Um, right. So I want to I want to introduce that uh, in, into into the seminar. But yeah, we'll also. Look, I, mean, I was talking to Jeb Bendel yesterday about the Mears project, the idea of putting like solar reflectors. You know, that, that's a kind of collective, massive project that could be engineered. We're also having James Ehrlich uh, from Stanford who mm -hmm. um, has regen villages. So it's this project to create these kind of like totally self-sufficient uh, communities where they have like every house has like composting and energy generation and, you know, aquaponics kind of built into it. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, we'll look at a, a, yeah. a range of, of uh, the, a range of options. But, I, I, you know, and, and one of my framings, I, as I said, I wrote a lot about shamanism and, you know, kind of uh, psychedelics and so on. Is this whole idea of initiation, 
you know, that actually um, it's almost like humanity as a whole, like it, 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 it kind of the initiations of indigenous cultures, you know, the, the, the individual break will be, will be forced out of the tribe, will separate from the community, go through these transformational processes and have this vision quest, and then come back into the community with a new vision. And you can almost say that humanity over the last five, 10,000 years has like separated from the community of life. And, we, and we've gone out on our own kind of like walkabout, our own journey to understand what we are and what we can know and what our visions are and so on. And now that we tip the balance in this way, we have to figure out how to come back, you know, it, it, you know to, 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 to reconnect with the community of life, you know, hopefully with the new knowledge we gain. So I think, I think framings like that, you know, that, that give it a sort of epic, mythic quality can, can be very helpful. They help me anyway. <laughs> And uh, Josh, maybe you could describe some of the people who are on, on coming in as as, as um, presenters and how that's going to work. Uh, I have some of them on screen. Well, I I just sort of reached for the stars, um, and I was really excited that so many of these incredible folks who've been working on this for decades said yes. I was really quite astonished. You know, we have, um, I mean, Bill McKibben, you know, has written I don't know how many books on this subject. <laughs> But more importantly, has been one of the most uh, courageous organizers in this space. Yeah. Um, and, you know, with founding of 350, uh, created civil disobedience actions that thousands of people participated in and um, tours uh, that the, the, uh, the thousands and hundreds of thousands of people came to um, and has really been just action, 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 action. Keep your eyes on the prize. Keep your eyes on the prize. And he has created this new thing called Third Act. He left 350. And I have to say that since he left 350, they have become very much less uh, action oriented in a way that I feel has not been good. Um, but he's created this thing called Third Act of, for, for um, his generation of people, older people who, you know, can, are in their third act, as he put it, to become active. And, and so, you know, I love his orientation, um, which is about how do we constantly keep our eyes on. He doesn't he doesn't like to talk so much about theory. It was really funny when I called me. I, I said, you know, how about just like, a, you know, a half an hour or an hour of teaching this class? Because that's sort of what we're asking. And he said, yeah. He said, at this point, a half an hour is all the wisdom I have left. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was really, you know, Bill is just, he's just hilarious. That's one of the things about him that's so tr charming is that he's so funny. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure he has more than a half an hour's worth of wisdom. But I think that that's what he's, what he was saying was that he was feeling quite defeated. You know, um, and, and many of us are struggling with this idea of defeat uh, and, and of, 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 of watching the window of time that we have slip away um, and not wanting to be Pollyannish about that, not wanting to be too rosy about that. I remember when I read um, Naomi Klein's book, This Changes Everything, uh, which came out the same year as my film, How to Let Go of the World. Um, and Naomi Klein had, you know, projections in her book that cut all emissions in half by 2017 in order to stop us getting to two degrees. And I was like, this book just came out. How are we in 18 months going to do this? Like, and right. I just felt that the whole premise was like absolutely insane. Like I couldn't, couldn't, I could, I didn't buy it. I didn't buy it. I was like, I love what you're saying. I love how genius you are. You're an amazing writer and what you've just proposed I think is literally impossible. And so, you know, why would you even propose it? We have to start going into adaptation and mitigation. And unfortunately, I think a lot in the climate movement, there has been, um, you know, this unwillingness uh, to, to face, I saw this just yesterday uh, on Instagram, Earth Education, uh, a big Instagram page on climate change was saying like, um, you know, I had made a post about how we we absolutely need to do adaptation and mitigation. And they started to say to me, well, in the, in the global south, it's an imperative that we do this, 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 and this. And I was like, yeah, yeah, but in the global south, we absolutely have to talk about mitigation and adaptation. And we have to talk about loss and damage. And we have to talk about climate reparations. We have to address the crisis that it is now, right? That's embracing the emergency. That's the difference. 
to me, the difference is about, are we going to continue to say, we have to do this with emissions, we have to do this in order to avoid a future, or are we going to say, we're in that future right now. And in fact, the, the, the global south or even the, the, the global south that exists within the global north, right? Exactly. So people, I was going to bring up that point. But point at 10, in Louisiana, the, um, you know, uh, the people, you know, are, are already experiencing these problems. And now is the time to say to ExxonMobil, you know, oh, by the way, you owe the world every last in every last dime of profit that you're making. Every last dime has to go to these to to the people who are star, have drought in in Kenya because they it hasn't rained in six years and that's your fault, you know it is it is. It is <coughs> yeah, that's not, that's going to be a t that's going to be a tough sell, Josh. <laughs> emergency is now. Yeah. Yeah. You have to have the framework for it. You have to have the framework to understand the emergency okay. that's on fire. Yeah. Then, so anyway, you were telling you were asking me about the, the the other guests. You know, these are some of the most active people. Um, Jane Fonda obviously has devoted all of this part of her life to to um climate change i was with her on on, on her um amazing uh friday's um fire drill friday where she was getting arrested every friday down in washington dc she she um, right. has, she's been brilliant her leadership has always been hey, uh, josh josh yeah i i've got to go and catch a train in, a, in a, like right. five seven minutes I, I, but i want to make one more sort of like a little statement before i do maybe i can jump yeah, yeah, in yeah, and and you can just guys hang, hang out. And Andrew, I'd love to connect with you. Maybe Josh can connect us by email uh, and send you some of my own work. And I'm sort of curious to have a dialogue with you also and hear where your thoughts have gotten to uh, beyond this, you know, this interview. Uh, but sure. yeah, I guess what I wanted to say is um, I, my sense is that many people are toggling between like, you know, people who are not, you know, deep in the activism world or, or you know, uh, they're sort of toggling between a few different perspectives. What is kind of a, and you know, they're, they're, if you look at studies, like a lot of young people think they're totally doomed. They think that, you know, they're not going to live, you know, long lives. You know, that's serious. Right. It's like 70, 70% 70 plus. Then there, are, you know, at the same time, many people feel that technology is just going to evolve and, and fix everything. That, you know, Elon Musk and AI are going to like figure it out for us. And nuclear fusion is going to come along, you know, and, and you know, there, there could be very positive things that technology could do. But I, I think what people aren't really, you know, grokking or, or sort of able to participate in this, this idea that, okay, maybe it does go, you know, brutally warmer, you know, three degrees, you know, you know, four degrees in the next, you know, 50 years, you know, but life is still going to continue. And, you know, for many people, and, and how are we going to live in that scenario? And, and that's part of what I would like to, to I, th I think this course to address, like, um, you know, yeah, I mean, even like if you talk to Jim Bendel, you know, he, he believes that according to projections, you know, if we stay over 1.5 degrees Celsius, uh, as, as we probably will over the next five years, that's going to threaten wheat production and rice production. So you'll have a bread basket failures. So there'll be a, you know, a big calorie uh, issue for a lot of people. And, you know, but that is something that people could, you know, start to prepare for uh, on different scales. Um, so stuff like that. I mean, you know, that, that that's where I think you know, we're, we're, people are, 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 are dis disconnecting, dissociating, you know, either because they think they're doomed and they don't want to think about it, they're just going to enjoy like the last days of Rome, or, and, or they think the technology is going to somehow, you know, miraculously create a fix. So that, that, that in between state, I think, is more likely to be, to be the realistic one. Right. Um, and that's where we're not, we're not really focusing. And I think if we can get people to kind of awaken to that, maybe there's still the possibility of a, of a different kind of social movement, you know, that's based on totally. mutual aid and um, particip participatory networks, kind of like, you know, we, we can't really, we're not, you know, maybe we're not ever going to budge the, the fossil fuels. I mean, we can slow them down. We can't like stop the juggernaut, but we could maybe build a whole like sort of mycelial infrastructure of uh, communities who are networked together who are, you know, learning from each other, you know. That sounds great. So yeah. we should we should do more on this uh, on the show, and I'll definitely be in touch with you because I think a lot about that all the time. In Bhopal, India, in the early days of the pandemic, I did a, a webcast with people across that city as as the country locked down, who had been a plastics kind of re waste reduction community, yeah. middle class yes. mostly, and then as Bhopal shut down, as the lockdown happened, they became a food distribution network. Yeah, they they take they took their existing network, which was just sort of a gentle kind of you know plastics thing, 
and started distributing food to the poorest people in Bhopal who were couldn't leave for their dollar a day jobs and were going to starve. So wow. that adaptability, adaptability. And then, of course, what happens when you do that is the network becomes trustworthy. You build trust and engagement beyond the network itself. And so that's all. Exactly. Good. Exactly. I mean, it, it's like we've had, a, you know, we have, you know, capitalism and the sort of the media, you know, system we have. I've like brutally constrained people's social imaginations and political imaginations. Yeah. And there's an opportunity as, as, as I think there is going to start being a realization, you know, that there's, you know, the whole thing is very deceptive and, uh, you know, tremendous lies yeah. have been, you know, you know, and, and, and sort of various forms of deception have been put over people. You know, maybe people can then start thinking about people power, you know, and, and how they actually work together in, in, in network communities. You know. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, again, uh, Daniel, it was really good to meet meet you. Uh, that was, that, thank be, you very much. Don't be late yeah. for your train. Okay. Okay. Good. And, and I'll talk and, to you later, Josh. Yeah. Yep. And we'll, yeah. all right. And we'll go into more details on this. Yeah. Uh, Such good, Josh. Right now. And all, thanks, on, Daniel. Talk ciao, to you ciao. Later. So, um, yeah, Daniel is a brilliant mind, and you know, this all starts because we have the same high school teacher, high school history. Yeah, he mentioned this. Could you um, actually go to tell us a little more about that? Yeah, well, um, so I was doing this conference called What Design Can Do in Amsterdam, which is not my usual type of mm -hmm. fair, like I, I, but I was invited to, to do it in Mexico City um, because I've made this, making this movie called The Welcome Table. And the table itself is sort of a design, I guess, that is a revolutionary idea, right? It's like, uh, you know, can we build tables instead of building walls? Um, so that itself was a, a sort of a, a symbolic representation. And they invited me to talk about that. But instead, I ended up doing a performance about nature and about what is nature. Um, and they liked it so much that they invited me to come back and do it again in Amsterdam. So when I was in Amsterdam, I was at this big dinner in this fancy place. And, um, you know, I was sitting at this table with uh, this variety of people that I didn't know. And then, boom, there's Daniel. And he's sitting next to me. And I was like, oh, I've, I've heard about you. You're... You're, you're friends with, um, uh, uh, we have a mutual friend in Alex Ebert, who is the um, the lead singer of Edward Sharper and the Magnetic Zeros, who did music for my film, uh, The Truth Has Changed. And we got to talking and lo and behold, Daniel, about uh, seven or eight years before me, um, went to my high school, uh, which was this, at the time, this tiny little socialist uh, high school on the Upper West Side. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, we had the same mentor. Uh, whose name is Joel Dorfler. Joel Dorfler uh, left uh, that school um, back in the early 90s um, and then went to Riverdale, where he became the head of the history department at Riverdale. And then he was ousted for because he was trying to teach a class on Israeli-Palestinian history um, and then retired, moved to Vermont. And last year he passed away, um, which was really, really tough because uh, Daniel and I were in a conversation to, to go and hang out with him up in Vermont. Anyway, it was really interesting to find that our worldview was shaped by this radical socialist history teacher, um, who was sort of the, the Eugene, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the, the Howard Zinn of, of, <laughs> Of our of our lives, you know, and we learned we read the people's history of the United States in high school. It was more, it was probably it was actually the top ranked high school program in the country by U.S. News and World Report. So, um, you know, uh, it was it was a place where you learned history and you learned it from a socialist progressive perspective. So that is sort of our base root, uh, both mm -hmm. Daniel and I um, being, you know, Jewish New York uh, kids, you know. Um, right. So and 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 involved and Daniel, I think, branched off into writing and this radical appreciation of of of, of um, you know ayahuasca and all the things that he did. Um, right. And I may I've been much more in the film and uh, and, and and music and theater world. Um, so you know it's it's uh, uh, it's but it's cool. It's a true meeting of the minds. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and you know we don't agree about everything and we have very very different life experiences and we have very different like appreciation of of you know reality basic reality you know um although we've both been to some of the same places in the peruvian amazon although i right. haven't i haven't taken the drugs you know what i mean like so yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's like there's um you know uh, and, and my world being much more in the activist category 
and his uh, and much more the literary and academic and and, and uh, profound thinking philosophy uh, category. So it's a fascinating uh, meeting, I think, and because the people he's bringing in are authors and thinkers and, and theoreticians and and philosophers, and the people I'm bringing in are like, you know, roll up your sleeves, let's go get arrested, <laughs> kind of people. So yeah. Um, yeah, that's the fun. That's the fun part of it. Yeah, and that gets to this. Um, what you were talking about earlier is. Uh, activism to what end and i think that you know historically like as i said about my journalistic journey a lot of activists through the early stages of the climate fight were uh saying the word no a lot mm -hmm. no this no that and and um i think that clearly now we're in a we're in a moment at least if trump doesn't wreck it because of the inflation reduction act and 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 the infrastructure law, which was a trillion dollars of, with a big chunk of it focused on resilient infrastructure and community empowerment. Uh, what I would love to see is a lot more of that activism directed toward, uh, hey, hey, town council in my community, here's a loan we can get that pays off in six months to change our streetlights to uh, LEDs or 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 to get some of this money. I'm showing. I did this piece. A while back on my blog on Substack about uh, build back better for who, and, you know billionaires they're all set up to get that money now from FEMA and the other agencies. But if it isn't if there aren't people at the local level who are willing to be the interlocutor between federal resources and 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 communities who have traditionally been locked out, then then there won't be more resilience where it's needed most. So th is that part? I think that feel I feel like that's part of you. when you talk about resilience mitigation, mitigation of risk, adaptation. It's about that too. Uh, is that fair to say? Well, I, I just read that a large portion of the Build Back Better money is going to roads. Which yeah, is just, right. There you go. A fucking disaster. We don't need more roads. We don't need more cars. We need less cars. Right. I mean. Our good friend Alec Baldwin yesterday just tweeted about how he was against congestion pricing. Oh, no. Like, are you kidding me? Like, no, we need less roads. We need less cars. We need fewer lanes. We need more speed bumps. We need more uh, one lane bridges. You know, we, we need to we need more. We need more trains. You know, as it turns out, rails to trails is not an environmental thing. <laughs> good thing. Although here in Maine, here in rails Maine, to rails. We need roads. Yes. To rails. yes. You know, oh, I like that. why the median strip is not being used as a railroad station makes right. no sense to me. We have the corridors already there, and the middle of the highway. Put a train there. That's where there are. They are the, every place you go in Japan or Korea. You'll see the train is in the middle of the highway. That's where it's supposed to be. You know, right. um, it's already laid out for us. All the places cars go, trains should go. We need to eliminate cars. We don't have enough. Um, we don't have enough time. We don't have enough infrastructure. Certainly, there's lots of conflict minerals around electric cars. Right. You know, fifty thousand people a year die from cars. You know, um, if I could have any one of the friends that I that have been killed in car crashes, I would never step in a car again if I could have any one of them back. You know, the truth of the matter is, like, embracing our emergency is also looking at this, the uh, the now, you know, and yeah. the now the now is, is an emergency like we are living. And, you know, like there's a really small example but it's an infuriating one here in New Orleans where I'm at right now, there's a place called city park. City park is absolutely beautiful. And there's a part of city park, which is pretty wild and pretty run amok and pretty, pretty awesome. Like it's got like, you know, overarching live oaks and, and plants that grow seasonally that nobody's cutting down and mowing and manicuring every five minutes. And right in front of that section is, an, is a youth farm called Grow Dat, where youth learn about how to grow agriculture. And lo and behold, the city of New Orleans right now just proposed to make a highway go right through that park. Oh, and it's like, what is the like traffic here is not bad at all. It's not you, you can get anywhere you want to go in this city for like in 15 minutes anywhere you want to go. It's a small city, you know, and we don't need any more roads. 
the cars most of the time don't even have there's no there ain't cars going by on the street right now like we need bike lanes we need bike consciousness it's also really nice weather here all year round to go on your bike i don't right. have a car here like the consciousness of we need more roads that's infrastructure equals roads is it is a thing to that that is going to put us in our graves right so we do have to do things that are going to wake up these questions and just this in the simplest possible ways right, right. oh you're 25 pounds overweight it's because of your car and well yeah your diet but also it's because of your car <laughs> right? right no oh you your death you, you, the life expectancy in america is going down it's because you're not walking you're not walking places yeah. and you, yeah. you know um like that's the thing and we are a nation that is sick and we are a nation that is 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 investing in all the wrong things so you know build back better you know a a andrew the the thing that that happened with biden and why his approval ratings are so low and why we're in this fix right now is not because things actually didn't improve things did improve under biden and a lot of the agenda that Obama couldn't get passed actually did get passed under Biden. And the okay. way that they passed it is the problem, though. The way that they passed it is that they called the climate bill the infrastructure bill. They called the COVID, the, the Child uh, Care Act the COVID recovery bill. And they did that because if they called it the climate bill, Republicans would have destroyed it in the media and they would have said, they would have whipped up all this culture war against it, right? So they got it passed, but lo and behold, they can't talk about it. They can't do the messaging that's necessary to actually revolutionize the consciousness of this country. Because when you call the, infra the climate bill the infrastructure bill, then all of a sudden everybody's like, oh, infrastructure, oh, roads, uh, bridges. Uh, yeah. They don't, they're not saying, oh, actually, it's because our climate is tanking and we're all, you know, we're all on the verge of apocalyptic collapse. You know, you can't do the messaging if you didn't call the bill that. So they, yeah. they did yeah. this, um, like the mo amazing thing about Obama was his messaging was amazing and his ability to get things passed was very, very, very poor. And yeah. the opposite is true of the Biden administration. And they don't have a person, uh, you know, uh, that actually gets out there and does the sell and does the revolution, does the actual consciousness building part of it. I mean, Kamala Harris, uh, it turns out, is is just as, as inept as we all thought she was at doing anything, uh, messaging or anything else. Like, we absolutely need to end at the same time, Andy, I'm sure you've taken note of this. Our presence uh, in the media has been utterly annihilated, right? At, when I came out with that film, How to Let Go of the World in 2016, because I was a Bernie surrogate and I was told this, you know, off the record by many producers, I was no longer going to be on MSNBC. That was it. And I had been on all the time. Um, our mainstream media outlets stopped broadcasting in information on the climate and on the environment. And they also s minimized progressive voices uh, because, and they, and, and then of course, uh, my project, the truth has changed, goes into this in depth. We don't have a mainstream media anymore that anyone cares about. I mean, we only yeah. have what people learn on TikTok, TikTok and Instagram, which as it turns out is a, is a tool for creating extremism and ripping apart the civic dialogue rather than encouraging it. So, you know, yeah. we're in trouble when it comes to basic analysis of truth in our American uh, media sphere, whether that's alternative media or, or mainstream media, we're in trouble. We don't have a consensus on what is reality. And when that has to do with things like religion, you know, okay, fine, like, let's argue that but when it has to do with science and the planet and technology and what's good for us and what's bad for us we're not have we don't have that assessment i am not being able to premiere films into a, a, a an arena in which there is going to be a, a a rational civic dialogue i don't it doesn't exist yeah so um for the workshop is there some well, what what do, when you think about communication success, given all those impediments and 
all that erosion and noise that you just described, what does communication success look like? And, you know, because that is a fundamental part of building a community or having yeah. some impact on the things you we were just talking about. Well, uh, you know, I, I went to participant pictures to try to pitch them on a film one time. And I was showing them how my movies do really well because we have an audience that's engaged. And I showed them our engagement tours. And we did 500 cities with Gaslight and How to Let Go of the World. And at each, location, at each location, we had, you know, hundreds if not thousands of people. And we had, you know, dozens of co-sponsoring organizations at each location, right? These were the mom and pop infrastructure. These are the, this is the, the, the nerve center of all activism in, in America on the environment. And these people were in a, we were in a dialogue. We were proposing this as a topic of discussion, this film, and then we would discuss. And the most important part of it, I would say, was not necessarily the film, but the discussion afterwards, right? Um, right. Where the community gets to talk to, to itself. And so when I think about this class, I think about this idea of leadership um, uh, emerging from, from the ground up and that that is a discussion. So when I went to participant pictures in Hollywood, I had shown them these pictures of the, the, the screenings and all these people. And they said to me, oh, Josh, whoa, wow. But when you get all these people into a room, what do you tell them to do? And I just went, oh, 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 this is, this is your problem. We don't tell them what to do. They tell us what to do. We're just telling the story. They're the ones on the front lines. They're the ones in the, in the trenches. They're the and ones who know. That and they know the, the local. They know the local like, context. Right? Yeah, they know what they're telling right. us what to do. Right. We're just there to be the big circus coming to town. We're there to help them. It's that agenda. So to me, what's happened right lately is that we are in this leadership void, which has to do with media. It has to do with um, you know uh, uh, Biden's lack of messaging. It has to do with. Um, this to me, this is a seminar for the thousand people who run those organizations, right, in those towns, um, coming together to listen to a, a, a wide array of people who have a lot of thoughts about this problem and then coming up with with ways to motivate the answer. Do you know what I mean? Like, so for me, it's it's that is where I'm aiming and I'm aiming to re I'm trying to restart that conversation about leadership because I think um, one of the bigger problems with the sectarianism on the left right now is that we're destroying the idea of leadership and I like leadership leadership matters like when you saw Bill McKibben leave 350 we saw all their radical actions kind of disappear because there was no weird insistent leadership person who was like <laughs> pushing that agenda and uh -huh. when you govern by consensus, I watched this happen here in New Orleans. Um, I was working with a coalition called Justice and Beyond and a guy named Pat Bryant, who had been with the civil rights movement and had been with the environmental movement for 40 years. He got up and he said, we need, because we were trying to stop a gas plant here in New Orleans. He got up and he said, we need to do a 50 mile march from Baton Rouge to Cancer Alley. And we're going to march five days straight. 10 miles a day and we'll get national media attention for this 50 mile march and i immediately was like i am 100 percent in and not only that i'm going to live stream and i'll make shorts about it as we go and da, da, da. and i sent this out to a whole bunch of lists of people and immediately uh, a hollywood celebrity donated a thousand dollars like that and yeah. the next day whew, can't i can't believe this happened the chippy organizer who was 25 years old white girl from Connecticut, working for Sierra Club, we went into the first planning meeting. She said, well, is everybody comfortable with this idea of a 50 mile march? And I immediately went, no, don't do this. And then all of a sudden people were like, well, I don't know. I, can, I don't know if I can do 50 miles. And boom, within two hours, this was now a two mile march one afternoon and got no press coverage whatsoever and no more donations from Hollywood celebrities. And that's what I'm talking about. You know, that's what I'm talking about. When we start talking about who's comfortable and who's consensus and da, 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 I want to be uncomfortable. I want strong leaders like Pat Bryant, who's been doing this for 40 years, who's 70 years old, right? Who marched alongside of Martin Luther King. I want him to set the agenda and go, boom, let's go for it. I want to see Dane Fonda, who is this bold leader, 
going for it. I want to see the leadership that I know existed in the in the grassroots. Barbara Arundel in 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 Damascus Citizens for Sustainability, in the Upper Delaware River Basin, or, or Sandra Steingraber saying we need a ban. Nothing but a ban will matter. That's leadership, and we have to have room for leadership within the policies that take care of people, right? Within the ways that we say, okay, you know, um, yes, we must take it into account everyone's voice, but we have we have yet to figure out on the left how to do that and still have the idea of leadership, which is bold, which sets an agenda, which you know, as a director, that's what I do. My job is to take the bar and set it a little higher, and then take the bar right. and set it. Higher. that's what leaders do and we have destroyed that because we don't have a national conversation because we don't have because on social media everything gets pulled apart because we have no more mainstream media and because also on the left we have a sectarianism that's ripping us to shreds so you know what this class to me is about is saying okay this is an emergency we're in a climate emergency we need boldness more than ever can we assemble this thousand people two thousand people whatever it is in this room and have at least the beginning of a conversation of where are we going now we, the, the the stakes are changed things are changed shit's on fire people are running through the streets with their children in their arms while they're watching their neighbors explode in their cars on fire what are we doing? That's what this is about. You know what I mean? Embrace yeah. is a positive word, but it's also just to like see the emergency, see it. You know what I mean? Right, right. Well, when I, I think you're getting back to what something we talked about at the beginning, which is realizing that there's a vulner, vulnerability emergency. Mm. You know, who is, who is, when you look at the numbers, like, like just take the Pacific Northwest heat wave that happened, that uh, heat storm that happened two or three years ago. Um, the When you look at who died or who, who uh, ailed, it was very easy to see there are people on the fringes, people who didn't have the money, like retirees in their metal um, you know, campers who didn't want to turn on their air conditioners. They even had air conditioners because they couldn't afford the electricity. They were homeless people, obviously, who didn't have a place to stay cool. Uh, Christy Ebby, who's a a climate and uh, climate and heat expert, uh, health expert in Seattle said the city was putting some of its cooling stations in police stations so that, you know, it's good to have cooling stations, but if you're uh, an illegal immigrant on the street, are you going to go to the police station to get cool? So in every community across the country, there's a landscape of vulnerability and an opportunity. The opportunity is community activists, you know, getting to the town hall, getting to the meetings, not just use, relying on the media, but getting, making the case for um, true resilience and true inclusive. Uh, well, but it goes in, it shows that these are all dovetailing crises, right? The migration problem, uh, the problem that we absolutely thrive off of and need immigrants to this country, right? For sure. Yeah, yeah. which is what the welcome table is about, right? Welcoming people. We're going to need to welcome a lot of people because, by the way, a lot of those people are also going to be us. Internal, you know, Abram Luskar, who is an amazing, amazing reporter, just coming out with this book called On the Move, which is yep. about how America, one third of Americans are going to have to move because of climate. Yeah. Like 120 million Americans. Right. So we're either going to be moving ourselves or we're going to be in the position of welcoming a hell of a lot of people and not just from inside the United States, but from everywhere. Right. We're going to be seeing the largest mass migration in history. A billion or so people in the next few decades are going to have to move because of climate change. Right. That's what the welcome table is about. So when you're talking about how immigrants are not going to go to the police station, you know, in making that film, um, I was in Brazil in Sao Paulo and just to the north of Sao Paulo in this place called San Sebastian, which is a beach town. Uh, yeah. Picture uh, the, the Hamptons, uh, really rich at this end, uh, uh, down by the water. And then uh, the south side of Chicago in the hills, just a couple of blocks up. Uh, imagine that uh, drug cartels and uh, poor people who service those rich people's houses and so on. Um, and lo and behold, there were landslides, landslides buried, you know, hundreds of people in that town um and if you i i was not acquainted with landslides mudslides yeah um they are a hell that i didn't understand i mean if you could imagine like just half of your neighborhood just now is under thousands and thousands and thousands of tons of mud because it right. rained so much that the literally the ground gave way and 
they're digging themselves out and there's this incredible social inequality happening in that town but somehow um my uh, subjects in the film um the majority of which turned out to be lgbtq and trans um the person leading the relief effort was a victim themselves of the of the uh uh mudslides and was a gay man who had to leave his spent time homeless because his family kicked him out and then um the the uh, two of the other victims one was a trans man another was a trans woman and they said you know we can't go to the local church to get aid because those are the places that have traditionally always discriminated against us exactly yeah all the sinners and the devil and everything yep. so we can't go to those structures unless those structures also are dealing with the other crisis and i remember standing rock same thing happened right at standing rock you had this incredible uprising unbelievable amazing uprising of all these people who came together to stop that pipeline and yet at the same time some of the traditional religious forces within that community were anti-LGBTQ and and sexist also. Yeah. And some of the younger activists started bringing this up. And I got a phone call um, at one point uh, from, from one of the leaders, I'll just not put his name out there, saying, we want to honor all the water protectors. We want everybody to come back to Standing Rock. We want to give them a, a, an award from our community. This was several months after everything had, had ended. And I said, OK, that's great, but can we also make sure that at that gathering, we are acknowledging the LGBTQ and the women uh, who showed up and put their lives and bodies on the line and honor them in a special way because they had to deal with double hardship. And the answer was, no, we're not gonna do that. They were like, no, we don't see what that has to do with anything. And I said, well, I'm sorry, I'm not coming. You know, because there we, we there was those dovetailing crises. So we, we, right. we are talking about values, we are talking about ethics. And we are talking about, um, you know, these systems have to change. And I think when we talk about fossil fuels, fossil fuels created the world they are now. And that world involves a lot of comfort, a lot of food, a lot of stuff, you know, energy use, right. cars, computers, everything. And also fossil fuels created a lot of, or rather exacerbated um, or played into the regime of colonialism and imperialism and capitalism and, and, and financial and social and class inequality. So as we transition away from fossil fuels, can we also say we're going to try to transition away from those, that system that those fuels supported? Because we absolutely have to. Because you have to you see Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. <laughs> you see them trying to be mega billionaires at the same time as sort of vaguely climate activists. But yet their space programs are going to inject more black carbon directly into the stratosphere. They're going to raise the temperature of the earth by two whole degrees. Just those space programs. Just those two, uh, three, uh, him, them and Richard Branson, right? So they can't be mega capitalist individualists and still say we're for working on climate change, right? Climate change has to have collective solutions. It has to have working together solutions. And lo and behold, that best mechanism that I can see for doing that is that activist framework that exists from town to town, especially in places where you've had an environmental crisis, right? So you've had fracking, you've had coal mines, you've had pipelines, you've had pressure stations, you've had a garbage dump, places where communities came together to form a resilience and a resistance to the big industries have a social infrastructure that can be reestablished to deal with climate change, to deal with welcoming, to be a bucket brigade, to make sure that we're, um, you know, standing up and helping for people who are in, in dire need of that help. So that to me is this, all these things in my mind, like I loved Occupy Sandy. If you remember Occupy Sandy, when Hurricane yeah. Sandy, New York, and all these people, all these regular old New Yorkers just stood up and said, I'm going to volunteer. And they went to churches. There are 25,000 volunteers a day to go out to the Rockaways and Red Hook and places that were really submerged under Sandy. Occupy Sandy was a phenomenal model. Exactly. There are models that exist. And I think it's a matter of talking about them and engaging them and saying, it's not just, we have a theoretical role to play. Um, it's not recycling and less plastic. And yes, of course, it's all that, but it's a much greater thing, right? It's, it's you know, if you have more than you need, don't build a higher fence, build a longer table. And how do we build those tables? We build them in those communities. And that's who I hope comes to the class. That's who I hope shows up at the class, the leadership of those movements that, that we really need to, to lead us to the next stage. So I'm showing, a, a, I think one of the, 
outcomes of the uh, workshop too is that the funding, first of all, I did see that there's scholarships available for some people or, or like a reduced fee, uh, but uh, funding that's raised, some of it will go to help complete your film. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the film? You know, what I like about, yeah, you know, we had our differences over fracking over back whenever that was 15, 10, 10 years ago, but but I really embraced uh, your, um, your style of approaching these issues uh, in your films. There's complexity in, in this is sort of implicit in how you approach these um, these issues. So, so what's what's at the core of your new project? Um, well, just to put a button on the on the end of the fracking issue, um, you know, I was with Tony and Graffia uh, last week, uh, and last I'm sorry, last last month. Mm -hmm. And um, as it turns out, part of the reason why we are seeing climate projections right now that are far worse than anyone anticipated 20 years ago is because we have this huge thing going on called the global methane spike. The global methane spike is not due to cows. It's because of fracking. There is a huge amount of methane, which in the short term heats the planet up really fast, right? By the way, if we were to ban fracking and stop all of that tomorrow, um, we would stop climate change in its tracks. It's the only tool left in the drawer, said Tony and Graffia stop all the gas because it's the methane. He said, he went so far to say, we've been focusing on the wrong gas. We shouldn't be focusing on CO2. We should have been focusing on methane because methane is now supercharging all those feedback loops. Everything that's happening right now, um, according to Tony and, and some others, uh, is being supercharged by the fact that we did fracking for all that time. So, you know, uh, think about that when we're talking about this uh, we we will do i done shows on methane and you know tony's one of many scientists working on these questions uh, but we i don't want to waste time right now on a methane from wetlands is, is that project, the, the gas and project may not yet be finished but um yeah so in terms of welcome table i became very focused on um how we were fit we were going to deal with i mean a lot of migrants a lot of people yeah. were going to have to move. And it was the best way for me, I thought, to make a movie about climate change that was in real time. Like, this is not a movie that's predictive about climate change. You know what I mean? Like, there's right. most of the films are predictive. They're saying this is going to happen and that's going to happen. And there's small examples of things happening. This movie goes from fire to flood to mudslide to drought to famine, yeah. um, you know, to, to, to another flood, you know, to more extreme weather. Um, climate change is happening now. It's like this giant Godzilla monster that's just stomping its way across the planet. And it's creating a lot of um, destruction. And it's also creating a lot of refugees, climate refugees. Um, and one of the great people in this film is called, her name is Amali Tower. She created an organization called Climate Refugees. Uh, she's a terrific, uh, uh, she's been on the forefront of this for, for a long time. Uh, and I go to Kenya with her in the movie um, to, to, to Turkana where it hasn't rained for six years. Uh, and the pastoralist indigenous pastoralist communities there are not able to live because they can't, their cows have no grass to graze on. So they are migrating into Uganda. That's causing uh, social conflict and war. Um, and, 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 you know, that's just one of 20 different scenarios in this right. film. So the idea was um, let's make um, a, a film about these scenarios where people are being forced to move. And that's, starts with hurricanes maria and, and irma in the virgin islands and goes to paradise california and then to the fires in boulder and then to hurricane ida here down in new orleans and, and in southern louisiana uh to 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 peru where the achuar tribe are fighting for their land against the fossil fuel industry uh to to, to brazil to the mudslides to australia to the lismore floods um and there's an emphasis throughout the film on um you know the conflict between indigenous values and and um what you might call Western colonial values or capitalist values. Right. Um, as it turns out, indigenous people don't cause climate change. They don't burn a lot of fossil fuels. There's a there's a different sort of symbiosis in, in living with the planet that we, uh, in the other side of civilization, the, the colonial capitalist civilization, really have to start to embrace and learn from. Um, and, you know, uh, and so the welcome table, um, I started off making a movie called The Border Table, where I was going to put a table right on the border. And then I was like, you know, I don't really want to get sucked into border issues. And JR is doing these amazing projects down there. And I happened to be in uh, the back seat of a car at 
midnight at a Bernie Sanders event that was going to happen the very next day with Dr. Cornell West and Heather Goutney. And we there was no place to eat. So we ended up at the McDonald's. So we're having McDonald's in the backseat of the car. And Dr. West says to me, you know, James Baldwin's last book was called The Welcome Table, but nobody's ever read it. Um, mm -hmm. it, it turns out it was a play um, that people have read. But but um, the, I said, The Welcome Table. Oh, this is a fascinating concept without even really looking into it so much. I thought this is much more universal than just the border. And right. then I got to New Orleans and lo and behold, the, one of the most legendary singers in New Orleans named John Boutte, who I had seen and we be, had become friends. And um, he really liked my work and his is an unbelievable genius singer in New Orleans, Creole culture bearing uh, guy. And uh, he sings us the welcome table, this song. It's an old, cool. old, old song, uh, uh, spiritual from the South. Um, and, uh, uh, he revamped it and I just thought this is an amazing collaboration potential. So we're going to, we did all the stories all over the world We're we have now invited all the folks from this movie to New Orleans for, uh, gathering, um, at this table. So yes. John begins the film by singing to this empty table. And then at the end of the film, he's, he's going to be seated at the table with all of these climate migrants. Now we only got half the visas we applied for. Like, so a lot of the people, most of the Africans are not allowed to come. Yeah. Uh, only one person got their visa of the Brazilians. Only four out of seven got their visas. Uh, you know, um, we have people coming from Nigeria and, and Italy and, 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 and uh, Peru and, and, and uh, Aboriginal leaders from Australia, you know, so there are, there's going to be this incredible gathering of folks who are on the front lines. Um, and, and it's going to be sort of like, I think of it sort of like a Shakespeare play, right? Like a Shakespeare comedy, not a tragedy. Most right. climate movies are tragedies. This is a comedy. And in a comedy, you have the lovers uh, that are thrown out into the wilderness. They have no country. It's either been a shipwreck or, or a political dispute. The, the lovers in As You Like It in Twelfth Night, they're out in the forest or in the tempest. They're marooned on an island. They've been separated from their nations and they have to find a new world. And at the end, the sages, the comedians, the, the 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 singers, the dancers, the smart people, the dignitaries, the the the, the, the royalty all welcome them, and then they all get married. That's now, right. nobody gets married in this movie, I don't think. I mean, we'll see what happens. Um, <laughs> but uh, when they get here, but um, you know, this idea that this is a symbolic marriage and this is a celebration, this is the fifth act. So we're doing that here in New Orleans, and not not just this one table of twenty feet with these twenty participants. Truly in New Orleans style, we're building this table 20, uh, 1,000 feet long. And we're inviting the whole city. Uh, and it's happening at Music Box Village. Uh, and then we're, we're walking, second lining, uh, which is a kind of parade with music, uh, up the up the levee. And that uh, last scene will be um, 1,000 people all standing in this idea of symbolic welcoming of the refugees and the climate refugees of the world. Um, we don't talk about this, but the wall is not just a migration policy. The wall is a climate policy, right? The wall is getting more money because we're anticipating climate refugees than our climate mitigation programs are getting, right? So right. a wall on its side can be a table. We need to be building more tables and less walls as we are going into the future, especially as the cries and xenophobic uh, racist cries for more walls get louder and louder. We have to start. Uh, this is the symbol that I'm hoping is uh, as powerful or more powerful than the wall. Uh, this symbol of celebration of cultures, the symbol of welcoming, the symbol of can we work it out through music, through song, through through um, an appreciation and dialogue with each other. That's great. Well, I'm, I'm really glad we could have this introduction to both the course that's opening up uh, April 28th and goes, there's 10 sessions that end like May 29th. And I like that illustration, which is, this all reminds me too of a lot of the work I've done, webcasts I've done with people working on what's, I hate the term managed retreat. You've probably heard that it, because it's so negative, it, it, but there's this These idea. These terms are always so like, oh. Managed retreat, WTF. Like back in, <laughs> I, 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 but I, then I keep saying like, come up with a better term. It, it's sort of, and I guess embracing community is part of it, you know, because um, the, the, there's a concept of what's called receiving cities. How do you become a receiving community? 
uh, becomes knowing that that's ultimately going to be to your benefit, uh, building uh, com new kinds of communities, as you were saying I, earlier. I an example, in Say I again? found cartoons from 1907, mm -hmm. which have um, Italians coming off of the boats, and the boats say this direct from the slums of Europe, and the Italians are these little rats. They are black mm -hmm. rats. And they're we have knives in their teeth, and they're crawling all over Uncle Sam as they arrive on the shore of New York City. And they say on their hats, mafia, socialist, communist. Mm -hmm. And if you can imagine, so same xenophobia, same racism, different race, different day, right? And so those are from 100 years ago. Wow. Can you imagine New York City without pizza? Can you imagine America? without pizza without bagels you know these are the folks who are going to bring the people who are arriving right now in new york these people from uh wow i think i found it is this the cartoon it's that's one of them that looks good that's a different one that looks like jews actually um but uh um you know that too uh let me just see i want to i want to zoom in on that's um, mine. Yeah, yeah. There's one. That that that's that. No, that th those are the Italian. Uh, I don't know what they are. They. That's the different one. But I, I'm going to screenshot. That See, it's clearly the same idea. Um, it's the same idea, though. So so so. Yeah, this, um, American views about the government's immigration policy as well. What is the pizza in a hundred years going to be? We don't know, exactly. but we do know that these people are going to be a benefit to us, right? They're going to be. It's our benefit to celebrate culture rather than ostracize and criminalize. And if we haven't learned this lesson by now, we don't know what America is, you know? Right. So that's the spirit of this, right? Um, that's such an interesting cartoon though, because the Pied Piper is Uncle Sam and he's leading them into the ocean. <gasps> well, that is actually yeah. happening. He's drowning them. Yeah. He's, wow. that's, that's happening. We report on that in the welcome table. You know, the Italian government has given warships to Libya, and they are calling that the Libyan Coast Guard. Wow. Come on, give me a break. Yeah, and they're they're sh they've been witnessed shooting at boatfuls of migrant people from Africa, who and one of the people who we are hosting here in New Orleans and our feature in the film is a guy named Chris Obehi, an incredible musician. Um, he survived passage across the Sahara and then in was in Libyan prison for two years made it onto a boat, was rescued by one of the Italian rescue organizations, and now is a famous pop star in, in Sicily. He sings a song called Non Siamo Pesci, which is uh, Italian for we're not fish. Um, and it's addressing the fact that the European Union is actively using the Mediterranean as a mass grave uh, and as a deterrent for, uh, for refugees. And they, we know that tens of thousands of people have drowned. And uh, so this cartoon here that you got is very emblematic of this thing so and right. that's, you know, that's that's the one that i'm talking about from the sun um daily mafia anarchist uh socialist these are italians as rats um so you know race is a continuum um what is an american is a, is a continuum um and we have to understand that you know there's enormous amount of racism right now at the border in New York City, where you have thousands of migrants that are being put in very, very inadequate conditions, they should be, um, you know, treated with respect and dignity and as assets going forward rather than as what, what you're seeing here. So that's some of the right. movie. You know. Well, it's great yeah. to get up with you. I'm very impressed with your, your Google search abilities. I, I, I am late for my next. Uh, no, this is fine. I, we'll. we'll Let's catch up when this is done and uh, what, what was learned from you through the process and we can do more. One more, yeah, well, one more plug. Um, not only these two projects, but I am premiering my film, The Edge of Nature, uh, at La Mama as a live performance for the for the last three weeks of June. So um, if you are a fan of theater, live performance, or my movies, uh, La Mama, uh, the great uh, experimental institution in, in downtown uh, Manhattan, um, I'm doing a performance there for three weeks. Um, and uh, so that's for a, a whole other film. I've, I've got a little bit of a backlog. As, 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 I, as I said, you know, mainstream media is not as kind um, to, uh, you know, voices like mine. Um, so I have three movies that I've made 
uh, that have never that have not come out. And I'm trying to figure out how to get them out in whatever way I can. And this the Edge of Nature is a great way to do this. Uh, we're kicking that off as a tour and we're starting it at, at La Mama. It, it, it premiered in Australia, won a bunch of awards. I can't get it out in America. I'm trying. But we'll see. Well, let me do what I can to help. Um, again, La Mama is great. They'll, great one of the last place I saw before COVID was was there. Uh, oh. It was a great climate play too by Karen Malpied. Anyway, oh. Josh Fox, thanks for coming on. Thanks, Sandy. I'm more and, talking. Uh, I really I look, appreciate it. And I hope everyone uh, can uh, check out your course that will be starting soon. And of course. Uh, everything else you've been doing just google I'd, for love to, I'd love to post this chat so make sure you get me uh, a link that I oh can. yeah it's it's already out there as soon as i hit stop the links are shareable for it by anybody uh, okay.